All right, what's up, everyone? It's Luke. Another episode of Not Related. We got here. I, I'm not even going to tell you what the book is. I mean, you can look at the episode title, but just listen. Listen to this. You hear that? You hear that thickness? That's the thickness of our book this episode. I'll talk about that in a second. First, I want to talk about why we're doing it, and that is we live in a very special time. Uh, the post-war era after World War II was defined by a very sizable intellectual consensus in the West, and that is that we are moving towards a kind of ethical, racial, cultural universalism. People might not put it in that kind of words. Nowadays, they call it globalism, right? It's the idea that we're moving to this inevitable end of history where we discard all of our quote-unquote superficial differences and we all become one people, standing around a fire, singing kumbaya, whatever you want to put it. Now, the book... now. As time has progressed, we have seen the rise not just of, you know, post-colonial studies on the left, but uh, nationalist movements on the right all across the world nowadays. It's not just an isolated thing. It's really everywhere. Japan, India, the West, even sort of America. Um, And we're seeing this rise of a reassertion of identity based on race or ethnicity or nation, however you define that. And I wanted to do an episode on this book because it really shows you how, although you might think you're red-pilled nowadays, you're only just starting to get into the rabbit hole. It's far deeper. That is, what defines cultural, ethnic identity is actually way deeper than what you might actually think. Now, this book, the title of this book is Albion Seed, Four British Folkways in America. It is by David Hackett Fisher. This was published in 1989. Now, it's not a political book. I gave sort of a political introduction. That's one of the reasons I I wanted to do a study on this book. But it is the thesis of the book is, is as follows. That is, we often think of the United States as being maybe a a country of British origin, uh, maybe more generally of a European or maybe white origin. But Hackett Fisher, uh, actually, I don't think that's a double last name. I think it's just Fisher. Um, But Fisher's argument is that really the core of the United States isn't really just one cultural group. The divisions are actually even deeper than that. His idea is that there are really four different Americas, four different cultural strands that come directly from Britain, from different parts, and create the United States as we know it. And they don't just create different cultural traditions that eat different food or something superficial like that, but that totally defy the define the worldview, the religion, the way of looking at politics, uh, everything about four ethno-culturally distinct entities in American history. And they're entities that people aren't often aware of, but they are very much there. So we're going to talk about that in this video. So as usual, I am Luke Smith. Luke at LukeSmith.xyz. If you have any comments, send them to that email address. You can send donations to paypal.me slash LukeMSmith. That's M as in matriculate. Um, Matriculate. That's the first word that comes to my head that starts with M. Anyway, uh, as always, we're going to go through... I I think uh, how I'm going to organize this episode... First, we're going to talk about the four different folkways, the four different groups that Fisher lays out as being defining American ethnocultural life. Then we're going to take a break. I'm going to read donations, comments from the previous episode. We got some interesting ones. And then afterwards, we're going to have, uh, well, I'll put it this way. Fisher, at the end of the book, gives a reinterpretation of American history. Not a reinterpretation, but a he shines a light on American history through the these four ethnocultural distinctions, um, well, not distinctions, but different groups. He shines light on American history in the light of those groups. And so after the break, we're going to run through his history with my own comments on America, given these four different groups. Now, let's go ahead and actually get into it. Maybe we should actually talk about, I've talked about these four different ethnocultural groups in the United States. What actually are they? Now, some of them have names, Uh, in traditional descriptions, but some of them Fisher actually has to coin names for, because although they exist as independent entities, people don't often have specific names for them. They haven't, despite the fact that they are very real, there's not a perfect word to cleave to all of them. But let's go through these four groups. I'll give a brief description, then we'll go in-depth in each four of these. Now, first off, one you've heard of, 
The first group is the Puritans. Now, the Puritans are a theocratic religious group. They come from East Anglia in England, and they move into what is now New England, right? So Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, you know, this kind of general area. And they are defined by, of course, extreme religious zeal and a kind of xenophobia to people who are not of that religious or ethnic persuasion. So they... I guess have what you could call an ethnostate in New England for several hundred years. Now, they are the basis in a lot of ways of the United States' intellectual culture. They found many universities, but they also have a distinct religious way of thinking that actually plays into their interpretation of education. But we'll go into that in specifics later on. So the first group is the Puritans. The second, second is what Fisher calls the planters. Now, the planters originally in England were an aristocratic group. They were royalists in the English Civil War. They supported the crown. Um, and they moved to what is now Virginia. Now, they have a very particular culture that is, I guess, tied to their aristocracy. And we'll talk about that in a second. In many ways, they form the basis of at least part of the American South, centered around Virginia. They were a group that, for example, had an underclass. They, they were aristocratically based. Their worldview was aristocratic. And they'd like, they brought over many indentured servants and later on slaves, slaves from Africa. And this, of course, is all part of their worldview. We're ta we'll talk about it in a second. So that's our second group. We have the Puritans, number one. We have the Planters, number two. Planters are the Royalists again. Number three is the Quakers. Now, the Quakers, if you don't know, are a religious sect or the Society of Friends is what they call themselves, I suppose. Uh, the Quakers are an, a religious group that come from different places, but mainly the North Midlands in Britain. So they come from the North Midlands. They are, unlike the Puritans, although they are very religious, they are not theocratic. They are much more accepting the people of different religious backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds. So they move into Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is their place, and they invite Quakers of other, from other places, from, for example, the Netherlands, Germany, stuff like this. And they also allow non-Quakers to move into the area. But the Quakers have a very distinct diction and a very distinct lifestyle that actually affects a lot of the people that move into their area of hegemony. So they're, they're less ethnically, uni or at least racially uniform, I, I guess in terms of genetics or something like that, because they, inv they have some other groups moving in with them, but they still are a cultural unit. Now, the fourth group is what Fisher calls the borderers. Now, the borderers, you can think of them as being sort of the American cowboys, or at least that's what they become, and that's what they were in the old world. Now, the borderers, they're called that way. Some people will call them the Scots-Irish, but Fisher argues that's not a very appropriate term because a lot of them have nothing to do with Ireland. They may have moved through it on their way to America. But they're called, he calls them the borderers because they are people that come from the border area between Scotland and England. And they live in an area which, in effect, is anarchistic. That is, it's not necessarily in the control of England or Scotland, and their cultural institutions and their way of life is defined by that anarchy. They become cowboys, they become independent, they become pioneers, and they are, you could think of them as sometimes being lower class people, although that's not always the case, but they are a, a rough and tumble people who originally move into Pennsylvania, but the Quakers, who are a little iffy about them, uh, settle them gradually into Appalachia. They move into a lot of the American South. They move into Texas, Arizona, parts of even Southern California, and they are a, a very interesting group in themselves. So we're going to talk first off of these four different groups in detail, not nearly as much detail as, in, as is in the book. Now, I will go ahead and say as a caveat, this book is enormous. As I said, a thousand pages. It is fantastic. If you, if you have to write some kind of term paper, just get this book, open a random page, and there will be enough to start on. You know, you could have, there are just universes of information in this book. It is a, a real pleasure to read. You could literally just open this thing up anywhere and, and find something really interesting. It draws from so much. Um, but I will just say as a caveat that my description 
of anything in, the, in this podcast is not nearly going to be as deep as the book itself. So if you're interested in any of this, pick this up at your library, buy it yourself, just leaf through it. There is so much in it. Um, it's just fantastic. Now, let's go ahead and get into these four groups. The first one, again, is a group that you've probably heard of, the Puritans. Now, the Puritans, when you take a class in American history, you're usually taught in one way or another that the Puritans are the origin point of all America. Now, again, the thesis of the book is that that's not really the case. Puritans are actually a relatively insular group. Later on, they will expand out westward gradually into Ohio, into Minnesota. They'll be overrun by other groups. They will invite in other religiously similar groups. But at the beginning, the Puritans are a, I guess what you could describe in modern terms as an ethnostate, a religiously based ethnostate, but re they were highly intolerant of other kinds of religious sects, and they really didn't want any other kind of contact with other people. Now, it's often construed that the Puritans came to the United States for religious freedom in the modern sense of the term, and that's not really accurate. They were seeking religious freedom for themselves, but that religious freedom ultimately meant a kind of theocracy. And that's what happened for the really hundreds of years New England was a kind of religious theocracy, and the culture of the Puritans is based on a kind of religious and moral consensus. Now, this, I think, has changed over time. I think a lot nowadays you'll look at New England and fewer and fewer people up there are religious, but I think the moral overtones of it, of the Puritan culture, really are still consistent. Now, the Puritans were also behind some of the great... I guess, moral crusades of American history. Two of the major ones are, are, of course, the abolition of slavery and also the prohibition of alcohol. Uh, Non-Americans might not know for a period of, uh, I don't know how many years actually, but it was totally illegal to sell or consume alcohol in the United States. Uh, Puritans were behind both of those movements, both alcohol and uh, the prohibition of slavery as well. Um, so they were behind a lot of these movements. Now, let's let's give a, a kind of a, a view of what Puritan culture was like. Um, now, it, again, it was based on a kind of moral consensus, and it was also part of that moral consensus was instructing young people and even older people in the religious traditions of the community. Now, Puritans had the highest literacy rate of any other culture, and that's because it was viewed as being very important to educate people, not just in reading per se, but reading for the express purpose of reading the Bible. And so for this reason, New England was home to many of the first Puritan uh, schools and also universities. The educational culture of the United States in a lot of ways comes from this kind of Puritan moralism. It's important to educate people so that they can, I guess, reach the kind of moral consensus and they can read the Bible themselves, find the correct ethical judgments, and understand the, you know, the implicit the, the implicit mores of the society. So now education wasn't just something taught in schools. It was also, Puritans were also very disciplinarian, I suppose you could think of them. And they had this concept of breaking the will of children. Children who were raucous or children who were hard to control were really constrained in extreme ways, I suppose. Um, they were punished sometimes severely, sometimes they were... Uh, Fisher goes into the ways that sometimes they were even tied up or tied to certain things to make sure that they couldn't cause trouble. Uh, Puritans, in a lot of ways, the important thing in their religious tradition was breaking the sinful will of a child and making him, I guess, obedient to moral authority, the moral, the moral authority of the Bible, or by extension, the religious community. Now, Puritans also were noted for not just, you know, getting rid of relig religious dissenters, be they Quakers, be they someone else. Um, they, of course, also are famous for Parts of American history, like the Salem witch trials, which everyone is pretty familiar with, they while this wasn't true of other cult, the other three cultures, Puritans were very worried about witchcraft, were very worried about the occult, and of course would persecute those kind of practices or perceived practices with, of course, even capital punishment. 
Now, Puritans were also extremely self-disciplined. The image of Puritans in movies is almost like not even that bad. When you see Puritans miserably sitting in a in the pews of a church and it's extremely cold and they're sitting there without any flinching or perceived pain or anything, that is the value of Puritans. It's to show, I guess ambivalence, to pain, to sit there, take it. Suffering is a part of the religion. It's important, I guess, for people to put up with the suffering of the world. Now, there's an interesting passage. One of the things that Fisher notes is that even when Puritans moved to the Massachusetts Bay Area, which is a place that was mostly abounding in natural resources, they like keeping up their tr- the traditions that they kept in England for so many centuries. Uh, on page 135, he actually talks about their diet. Uh, he says, For three centuries, New England families gave thanks to their Calvinist god for cold baked beans and stale brown bread, while lobsters abounded in the waters of the Massachusetts Bay and uh, succulent game birds slowly orbited overhead. Rarely does history su- uh, provide so strong a proof of the power of faith. And this is the mindset of the Massachusetts Bay Puritans. They want to live in a they want to live in a way where they're not enjoying things too much. They are putting up with this, their lot in life, and that is an important moral aspect of life. It's important to stay away from too much enjoyment or too much um, revelry because that might lead to temptation. Now, of course, they also vary, you might know from fictionalizations of the time, like the Scarlet Letter, that they are very much against any kind of sexual misconduct, premarital sex, anything of the sort. It's not to say that they were unromantic in the confines of marriage. Uh, Fisher does provide many examples of, you know, endearing relationships, but they were, as their name suggests, very Puritan. Uh, So this, I guess, should give you a view of the kind of Puritan mindset. I think this, more than the other groups, is one that people sort of know about. Now, again, I've given you a very piecemeal account based on stuff that you might already know. Uh, But if you look in the book, you'll see that Puritans not only have a distinct way of architecture, but you can look in the specifics of their diet, their clothing, etc., which I can't go over for time. Now, so what about Group 2? Now, Group 2, again is the planters and the planters come from various areas but mostly southwest england and the planters were the royalists they were supporters of the crown in the english civil war and their ideology is based on that and sort of their aristocratic nature now the core ruling class of course is a series of more or less related families with particular surnames who come to the United States who are extremely wealthy. And they bring with them uh, indentured servants. Now, if you don't know what this is, if you're not familiar with American history, indentured servants are people who basically want to move to America to start a new life, but they don't have enough money for the voyage. So what they do is they promise someone much richer, like, for example, the planters, They promised the planters, okay, I'll work for you for free, more or less. I'll be your slave, in essence, for 5, 10, 20 years, something like that, so long as you pay for my voyage and you pay for my living while I'm working for you. So the planters are not just a kind of upper class from a particular area. They're also indentured servants that come with them. Now, the planters have a worldview that is quite distinct, very different from not just ours, but the Puritans as well. Now, one of the planter families, and Fisher goes into this, is the Filmer family. And one famous name in the Filmer Filmer family is, in fact, Robert Filmer. Now, if you took the NRX pill, you may already know who Robert Filmer is. But Filmer wrote a book called Patriarcha which uh, I think the subtitle is The Natural Power of Kings. And it was a defense of divine right, absolute monarchy. And we don't have to go into the specifics of the book, but I guess the general idea is that the natural order of society is one where there is a patriarch, where there is a, on earth, there is a ruling king. And he 
in effect has full control and then at lower levels of societies there are families which again are sort of patriarchal they have uh, a leading man and of course all of this is under the universe which is run by the patriarch of all and that is god now robert filmer of course wrote this book that sort of illustrated this political ideology but it also vibes with the the planter or the royalist ideology generally this is their culture it's built on a view of society that's hierarchical, where there are some people who are aristocrats and it is their lot in life to rule, and there are other people who are lower on the totem pole. It's their lot to, you know, for I guess uh, serve whatever goal they're supposed to do. Uh, maybe they're workers. Maybe they have some some goal in life, but. Uh, people are born with a particular station, and they should work in that station. Now, the royalists move to the United States. Again, they come with a lot of indentured serv servants, and they come with a lot of wealth. So they begin to create a kind of culture that's similar to what existed in England originally. So it is a stratified um, it's a, a stratified society, and when the indentured servants run out, they the, the planters are the ones who actually begin recruiting, or well, not really recruiting, but buying African slaves. Now, Fisher actually notes there's this idea that sometimes people have of the, I guess, the plantation culture that arose in some parts of the antebellum South. There's an idea that there is an aristocratic culture, and that comes from the fact that slaves were... Uh, bought and moved to the United States. But Fisher actually says that's putting the cart before the horse. In his view, it's really the aristocratic culture that was there in the first place, and that motivated the purchasing of slaves, that motivated the slave trade as it uh, moved to the United States. So that's, that's his view of it. The planners, in essence, wanted an aristocratic society, and when that, that uh, lower class of indentured servants ran out, um, they begin drawing their drawing people from Africa, buying them from the slave trade. Now, the I guess the patriarchal views of the planters aren't just in reference to political life, but they also have sort of uh, political view, or I guess you could say like views of gender relationships that are very patriarchal in the same way. That is, their view again of the family is that it is the man's. Uh, well, of course, everyone at this time had the idea that, well, of course, yes, a man is the director of the family. But this is very strong in the planner society specifically. And in fact, they had many cultural institutions. Uh, while, for example, in Puritan society, if two people were found being unloyal uh, or infidel, infidelis, <laughs> uh, not faithful in their marriage, they were usually punished in Puritan society more or less equal, both men and women. But planters, I don't know, I, I guess you could say that planters had more of what you could call nowadays thought patrol. That is, planter society, uh, while both men and women were punished, the, emph the emphasis was more on female infidelity than male fidelity. And you, you also have to think of the gender politics of planter society. Now, when Puritans came to America, they, there were more men than women, but not that many more. But planters, I, I forget the exact statistics in the book, but it was something like 15 men for every female or something ridiculous like that. In fact, um, nearly everyone who was coming to the United States as part of the planter movement were either aristocrats or indentured servants, and women are not going to be indentured servants. This is going to be something that a man is going to want to do. You know, uh, you know. oh, I'm going to move across the world. I don't have anything else to do. I'm going to become, you know, a worker in a, a totally foreign land. That's a, a male thing to do. So there were very few women, and the culture sort of evolves around, it, well, I guess what you could call incel rage. So there's a lot of masculine energy, and there aren't many women around. Uh, what's even more is that since it's a very aristocratic society, access to females is limited to, a, limited to a very small portion of society. Now, one person in particular that is talked about a lot in Albion Seed is one person, uh, what's, he's one of, uh, let's see, oh, William, William Byrd II. He's part of the Byrd family in Virginia. And William Byrd II does us the great favor of leaving a diary to go through his daily life and it is hilarious it's almost sad but it's a pretty raucous life that is he's an aristocrat and really day in and day out you know uh he talks about okay i had to beat this servant today 
uh, beat this indentured servant, and then he goes on. Every single day, he has some kind of sexual encounter with a different woman. Maybe he just, you know, grabs the behind of some random woman in, in you know, life or something like that. Or maybe he sleeps with the servant, or maybe he does this or that. He's philandering all the time. It's sort of, uh, it gives you a view of the kind of mindset that these guys have. And of course, he... he says a lot of this stuff with guilt, but obviously not not enough guilt to not do it, you know what I mean? So he lives in the society where um, there's very few women, but they're uh, for the aristocratic people, for the people who are higher up in station, at least at this earlier part of the uh, planter society, there's very much, uh, I guess, a lot of instability and lack of social cohesion. Now, this isn't to say that this is going to survive forever, because obviously, you know, eventually there's going to be a population of married people. It's not going to be indentured servants forever, but you have this supreme kind of inequality, and the ruling class here is going to be a little blasé. Um, now, we'll talk more about the ideology of them or their conception of liberty in a bit, but hopefully this will give you a view of what exactly the planters were like. But one passing note on linguistics, on the language that the planters spoke. Now, all of these groups, all these four groups are, of course, English-speaking groups, but they speak systematically different varieties of English. Now, I'm going to read directly. Now, again, note planters are high class, they're very aristocratic, and they have an aristocratic way of speaking. But that aristocratic way of speaking several hundred years ago is going to sound very different. Um, if we say it today. So I'm going to read, this is from page 257, and this is going to give you an idea. Uh, well, I'm just going to read it, and then we'll talk about it in a second. Now, uh, this is me reading. Where a northerner, that is a Puritan, said, I am, you are, she isn't, it doesn't, and I haven't, a Virginia, even of high rank, preferred to say, I be, you be, she ain't, it don't, and I hain't. The people of the Chesapeake used like for as if he looked like he's dead. Boston's James Russell Lowell noted with an air of disdain that this construction was never found in New England. Now, the interesting thing about the planter culture, again, although they are a high-class aristocratic group, they speak a variety, of, a variety of English, you know, saying you be, he ain't, stuff like that, that nowadays would come across as extremely uh, small-brained, I suppose. Now, this is characteristic of Southern dialects uh, as they exist nowadays in the United States. And this is because a lot of the planter culture, including that linguistic aspect, actually becomes... It merges with the borderer culture that we're, we'll talk about it in a bit to provide a lot of the situation that we actually have in the modern South. And the language of the planters, uh, although it sounds sort of silly to us now, this is a holdover of this old aristocratic Virginian accent. And of course, it actually does indeed come from their home in Southwest areas of England. So, at the time, it's important to remember, like, English has, at the time in Britain, there were many different varieties of English and many different standards to which English was held. And this particular variety of English spoken in Virginia, which later becomes came Southern English or Black English, get, get parts of it, it was highly perceived back then, despite the fact that some of the same constructions saying I ain't or they don't or, so, or well, everyone says they don't, like he don't, that's what I meant. <laughs> uh, saying constructions like that sound silly to us now, but at the time they were very highly perceived. And what happened is this aristocratic dialect sort of, I guess, trickled down to other portions of society. As opposed to, again, New England, which had an accent. I didn't talk about it, but New England had an accent that, uh, you know, they said thar and har. I, actually, if you read, if you read like H.P. Lovecraft, sometimes he'll talk about the rural people of New England and how they speak, and it's actually a decent rendition. So you could check that out. But anyway, so that's about it for the planters. Now, the Quakers differ from the Puritans and the planters in pretty significant ways. They are the opposite of the planters in the sense that while the planters are highly aristocratic, the Quakers are extremely egalitarian. So 
Now, the planters are actually very traditional Anglicans. They believe in this kind of hierarchical church, whereas the Quakers or the Society of Friends, again, this is a religious movement, they have an extremely egalitarian way of looking at religion in which there's not even necessarily a formal church hierarchy. Uh, it, the reason they're called Quakers, if you don't know, is because Quakers would have meetings, uh, religious congregations or whatever, and d during the services... God could speak through any person there, and when God spoke through people, they would begin to shake, they would begin to quake. So other people would call them Quakers. So as opposed to the sort of aristocratic way of looking at society, even in church, the Quakers had the idea that anyone can be a vessel for God. Uh, and they were also, so this is in you know, opposition to the planters, but in opposition to the Puritans, the Quakers had a kind of, uh, a very tolerant view of religion. Although, like the Puritans, they were, they were extremely religious, they had a view of toleration and actually tolerated uh, many of the people in you know, the Puritan world and invited people even who are not uh, Quakers to the area. Now, nowadays, we don't necessarily think of Pennsylvania as being Quaker territory, and that's for a very specific reason. It's because that Quakers, although they create a culture that still sort of continues in diffuse ways in the United States, Quakers invite uh, a whole, they, are, they pretty much invite whoever wants to come in different regions of Europe uh, to the area, and many other people settle there who are not Quakers. Their toleration gradually gives way to them being replaced by other people. Now, Quakers survive for quite I mean, they're still around today, but the Quakers are still dominant in Pennsylvania for quite a period. But um, their view, uh, their I guess the cultural values that they have still have uh, effects on the area and actually America generally. So one thing that Quakers popularized at the time um, is they don't necessarily like defer it, calling people sor calling people sir, calling people my grace, my lord, which would be normal for a planter. Quakers uh, popularized, for example, the handshake. Now, the handshake, we sort of take it for granted, but it is a very egalitarian way of gre greeting someone. It's not like one person is bowing to the other. Quakers popularized the handshake as a particular way of greeting people where everyone is on the same footing. Now, linguistically, since we talked about language uh, a, minute ago, a minute ago with the planters, the Quakers preserve some sort of interesting aspects of English. One of them is the second person singular pronoun. So English, like most, English used to be a more normal language. Now, most normal languages will have two second person pronouns. There will be for example, a singular pronoun that refers to one person you're talking to, let's say you, and then a plural pronoun, which will be like you all, you guys, or something like that. In English, we just have you, and you have to throw all or guys on the plural to make it plural. But historically, you was a plural pronoun, and the singular equivalent, when you're talking to only one person, you use thou or thee. Now, the reason why thou or thee fell out of the English, this is actually not directly related to Quakers, but we'll get to it in a second. But the reason that thou or thee fell out of the lexicon of English is it, become, it became, I guess, polite or deferential to refer to someone who is higher in station as you, as the plural pronoun, rather than thou or thee. So gradually over time, so a process occurred where people were being more and more polite, more deferential to people until you just became the only pronoun left. Now, at the time that the Quakers were settling this area, thou, thee was still common, commonly used in different places. And the Quakers, they actually uh, preserve the use of thee. They'll say, actually, they won't say thou art, they'll say thee is. That's another story, but uh, they still use the second person singular pronoun. And at the time, this was perceived as impolite or indignant or not necessarily... Uh, I mean, it's egalitarian. If a Quaker would talk to any kind of uh, high church Anglican, you know, a, a planter, and refer to him as the, he would probably get upset. Actually, Fisher in the book has some stories of Quakers who 
refer to people as the and they get extremely insulted they might beat them with their cane or something like that or you know the quaker refuses to call them my lord or something like that and this sheds a lot of light on the quaker mindset they are radically egalitarian now it's not to say they they think that every uh anything goes everyone's equal they do have firm religious beliefs and the way that fisher puts it i think is they believe in a kind of moral aristocracy that is uh, God can speak through people, but you have to be more or less open to it. But this is the Quaker mindset. I think the Quaker mindset is a little bit more what we would think of as being modern. I think a lot of people look at the planters or the Puritans and sort of think of them as being uh, alien cultures, although they do survive, and they do survive in important ways. Now, the Quaker culture survives as well. It's maybe a bit more friendly to modern sympathies, but uh, one of the reasons that Quakers aren't so popular, or you don't really run into Quakers that much, is simply because Quakers were so accepting they literally just let many people in. Now, although the Quakers were very sympathetic, very open people, there was one group they didn't necessarily like that much, and that last group is our fourth group. It's the Borderers. Now, the Borderers, I think I said earlier, are sort of like the American cowboy archetype in a lot of ways. Now, again, they're traditionally called the Scots-Irish. That's not necessarily a correct term to call them, but the Borderers have a very interesting history. Now, England and Scotland have been off and on in war for time immemorial, nearly, and the borderers are the people who live sort of between the two states um, for centuries and centuries. And you have to put yourself in their position. They're people who don't necessarily have a government. They live in a kind of anarchy because they live in two governments that don't necessarily have full control of the region. So borderers are pioneer people. They are people who are not necessarily, they're almost, I don't want to say barbarian, it has bad connotations, but they are uncouth, they are individualists, they are survivalists. Again, they're cowboys. Uh, and their social institutions are circu circulate around personal independence, personal autonomy, and they also have a strong sense of honor. And part of that sense of honor comes from the fact that you have to defend your reputation in a position of anarchy. Now, the borderers, they come originally to different parts of America. They filtered through, sometimes through Pennsylvania, actually, where the Quakers are. And the Quakers sort of push them off to the west. Uh, they originally think, okay, well, you know, these people are a little crazy, but uh, you know, they're sort of cowboys, but it, maybe we could at least put them between us and the Indians or something like that. So they push them into the Appalachian Mar Mountains, and borderers expand very quickly all over the American backcountry. And I think I said earlier, they later expand to parts of the south, to Texas, to Arizona. Now, borderers come with a lot of uh, cultural things that we sort of associate with early America. One of them is the log cabin. Now, racially, I should say, borderers, again, I said it's not necessarily uh, correct to call them Scots-Irish. They're actually a people of, I sort of want to say a mixed ancestry, because they're right at the border of England and Scotland. This is also an area that got, uh, during Dane law, during the, the Scandinavian invasions, got a lot of Scandinavian culture and uh, relationships during that period. So they have a culture that is generally Celtic, generally Germanic, and they preserve some things that are actually, for example, Scandinavian. One of those things is the log cabin, uh, which they bring to the American backcountry. Now, I didn't go through all the architecture of the other cultures. Again, you'll have to read the book for that because there's just so much to talk about. But borderers bring the log cabin uh, and settle mostly in the backcountry. Now, they, religiously speaking, many of them were Presbyterians. Uh, as time goes on, they'll convert to other religions. Um, but, uh, you know, Fisher presents a couple uh, anecdotes where really their priorities were, I suppose, well, actually, I, I think I wrote it down. Um, their pri religious priorities were, quote, the camp meeting, the Christian fellowship, the love feast, the evangelical preacher, the theology of Protestant fundamentalism, and born-again revivalism. That is, uh, a lot of borderers affect the mentality of churches that exist in the United States now, where they're not so focused on the autism of doctrine. They're focused on uh, the 
the son of the kind of deep wisdom or the moral teaching behind preaching it doesn't necessarily have to be ideologically consistent but it's also about as he says the christian fellowship the meetings they all have revivals and stuff like this their religious traditions are very much the opposite of the the anglican uh mode where there is a church or something like that uh in the borderer mindset everything is very decentralized there is not necessarily uh, centralization to the religious organization now in the same way they have a lot of i guess pre-modern i don't well i don't want to say pre-modern it comes with bad connotations but they have a lot of folklore as it contains to for example medicine uh Fisher actually goes through a whole lot of their traditional remedies and stuff like this. They have a bunch of sayings. And they're a society which, compared to the Puritans, well, they're sort of the opposite of the Puritans in a lot of way. While the Puritans are uh, style themselves as learned and will be highly literate, the borderers are the kind of people who will brag about being country people. They'll brag about not knowing how to read. They'll have folk knowledge. They don't necessarily care about learning or any of that silly stuff. And they actually bring with them a bunch of, I guess you could even say pagan folklore into their mindset. But again, borderers are unified by severe independence. They want to be independent from the control of everyone else. And they are used to a cultural mindset where they live at the margins of society. They live where they live in a place where they can be their own kings. And the organization of borderer society sounds like what you might hear of the Scottish Highlands or something like this. They are loosely organized into clans, which are not necessarily based on descent, but they're based on concurrent marriages. That is, if you marry the, another woman, she uh, and your families are sort of merged in the clan or something like this. So there's very much... Everything is sort of a practical, all the social institutions are sort of like practical institutions to survive away from the interference of the government, as you could put it. And they, again, they are very country people. Uh, one of the sayings that uh, Fisher mentions that uh, they means a lot to them is, the more dirt, the less hurt. That is, borders almost even dislike cleanliness. They dislike overthinking things. They like... Uh, being rough and tumble, and you can still feel a lot of this mentality, not just in Appalachian people, not just in Southern people or Western people, but it's a mindset that has sort of affected a lot of American thinking generally. The borders are one of the most widely spread groups of these four. Now, we've gone through the four groups, and I want to take a break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to read donations. I'm going to read emails. And then I'm going to run through Fisher's rendition of American history with these four different groups. How American history is mostly an ethnic and political conflict between them with different alliances and reorganization and all the rest. And I'll also talk about the different conceptions each of these four groups have of politics. And as Fisher details it, the idea of freedom, the idea of liberty, because to each four of these groups, the word freedom means something very, very different. All right, and we're back. So, again, luke at lukesmith.xyz, that's the email. paypal.me slash lukemsmith, that's M as in uh, Mexico. So, you can send donations, send emails. I'm going to read out a couple of them. Let me pull them up. I should have pulled them up right before I started the recording, but okay, we're here. Um, so I have a couple, well, first off, thanks everyone to who is on my PayPal. Again, I, I should probably not give you out all these links. I should just tell you, go to my website, lukesmith.xyz. It has links to everything there, everything you could possibly need. At least everything I think is important. I mean, right. Um, so let me read out a couple donations. So Lunario sends two, uh, $10, oh, excuse me, not dollars, euros. That's a little bit more. Um, so he has, uh, I'm not going to read out his entire, he actually has three questions, they're all pretty long, but I'll, I'll sum them up. Um, he wants to talk about Schumpeter's ideas in contrast to, for example, Uncle Ted's or Nassim Taleb's or stuff like this. Let me read out one of his questions. Given that modernity, industrial society slash bugmanhood, or whatever you want to call it, clearly sucks, in which ways do you propose to counter it? In this vein, how is it the ca how is the cabin building going? Are there other things you think everyone can do to resist bugmanization? Well, you know what? To answer that question, I'll, I'll probably 
uh, I guess I could bring in the example of the borderers in this episode, right? Or really any of these cultural groups. The thing to remember is that if you're fighting bugmanism, if you're fighting modernism, you don't need to have an intellectual rebuttal to it. You just need to base a society, base your cultural institutions on your needs. You can look at many different uh, societies emerging uh, political organizations right now. There are a lot of, for example, right-wing groups right now in the United States that I know of who organize, they, they might have political views, but they also have, I guess, a social organization to them. They will have, people will know each other's families, they'll take care of each other when they get doxxed, they'll do something like this. And I think that any society, any future society is not going to be planned. We're not going to sit down and plan it. It's something that has to emerge. So I would say, if you want to con counter bugmanism in your life, be involved with whatever cultural environment you come from. If you come from a Methodist church, even if you don't believe in God, maybe you should go to Methodist church again. I'm not, uh, of course, I don't think you should go to Methodist church. I think you should go to a Southern Baptist church because that's my background. But uh, just whatever you know, you should be sure not to sever your roots with it, even if it's something like religion that you might not necessarily believe in, because you'll regret it sometimes if you do sever your relationship with that. Um, let's see. And, well, Lunaria has a third question, which is, is sort of similar to that, but uh, I might respond to him via email since it was a pretty long email, but uh, that's that. And I will say, in terms of donations, I actually got this week, I'm very thankful for this, I got the biggest donation I have ever, ever gotten by PayPal. And that is, I've gotten donations as large as $100, but this week, uh, actually just an hour or two ago, I got, uh, I don't know if I should read his whole name out, but I got $500, huge donation from a Michael T. So thank you, Michael T. Um, and he is based on an email he sent me. Uh, it seems like he's a user of LARBs and incredibly enjoys it. So if you don't know what LARBs is, again, just go to my website, lukesmith.xyz, and check it out. Because you might, if someone is going to donate $500 to me for this, it obviously is worth it to someone. So maybe, I'm not telling you to check it out and donate to me. I'm just saying check it out. Maybe you might like it. So uh, so that's donations. Um, uh, I honestly cannot uh, express how happy I am about getting $500. That, uh, that means a lot. I've already emailed Michael. Thanks. But uh, yeah, he definitely deserves uh, some thanks on air for that. It's not really on air. It's a recording. But you know what I mean. So thank for the thickest donation I've ever gotten. Thank you, Michael. So let's read a couple emails and comments. I think I just have three here. Uh, an email from another Michael. There are a lot of Michaels out there, as it happens. He asks, my question is as follows. Does Schumpeter define what, uh, what he means by capitalism and socialism? It seems to me as if he presupposes a definition of capitalism as what we have right now. That's a good question. Um, I think, uh, well, Schumpeter does have his own definition of capitalism, but I think in the context of what the word it was invented to mean, you have to remember that capitalism as a word was effectively invented by socialists. It, it is a word that, it, it's on a, honestly a kind of rhetorical trick. That is, if you are creating a new ideology, and let's say you have this ideology, let's call it socialism, and let's say that socialism, I want it to be the ideolo ideology that everyone likes and everyone is going to like uh, when it wins and sets everything straight. So in my view, I'm going to portray my ideology as everything good. And I also need a term to describe everything in the world that people think of as being bad. And I think there's a sense in which capitalism is was invented as a term that means precisely what we have right now. That was the rhetorical purpose of coining it. Now, we can relate it to something like private property. We can relate it to something like some kind of econ lack thereof of like economic regulations or something like that. But I think at the core... I don't know if this is a hot take or what, it's just my, my view of it, that in real life, ca what capitalism means to someone who is a socialist is all the stuff that exists in the real world that I don't like. Um, you know, inequality, that's capitalism. 
imperialism, that's capitalism. Uh, differences between men and women, that's capitalism. Uh, racial differences, that's capital. Everything that I don't like is capitalism. And I think that's that's sort of the way people use it. And that's sort of the way that, that uh, Schumpeter is using it. Although I think that he would be willing to describe it as private ownership of the means of production, however that is construed. But I just want to say that I, I think in general, most of the time when people use the term capitalism, they mean it as what we have right now and not necessarily much more. Uh, another comment. This is from Pepe Brian. I, oh, I read his a comment from him last time, but I guess he gets two. He says, is there a chance that Terry had a bicameral mind? That is in response to uh, the late Terry Davis, who died uh, very recently, who was schiz schizophrenic. I did a brief video on that. But, um, well, as it comes to Jane's idea of the bicameral mind, uh, well, yeah, he probably did, because James's idea was that schizophrenia was a kind of vestigial part of the bicameral mind. And so in some sense, what Terry's hallucinations or however they appeared to him in his brain, what they could have been is some kind of vestige of, uh, I guess, that, that different mental frame that pre-conscious, pre pre-modern consciousness people had. So, eh, well, something to think about. I'm not going to I'm not going to stake my career on something like that, but, you know. That question was probably actually a asked as a joke, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so Tori asks, It was interesting to hear Schumpeter's view on the intellectual class and their contempt for competency. I first started thinking about this when I read Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. There was a scene in the book where one of the characters, a network engineer, was at a party and his girlfriend, who had uh, the sentiment of the referred uh, or, excuse me, gravitated toward the intellectual crowd. The scene is brilliant at catching the sentiment of the referred topic. Ironically enough, it's the intelligentsia in the field of economics where I see this played out the most. I get the real impression that a lot of these economic academics have a deep-seated contempt for entrepreneurs who didn't go to college but yet are very wealthy due to the building of successful businesses. I also get the feeling that the more tangible the business, the more contempt. Uh, well, that's less of a question. It's more of a comment. I think that's something to think about. I don't think that economists have the most contempt. You haven't seen the amount of contempt that, uh, for example, your average sociologist has for society at large. Um, there's a lot of contempt out there. You, you guys got to go to graduate. No, don't don't go to graduate school, but go to graduate school and realize how how bad it actually is, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that, that's about it for comments and emails. There are, of course, more. I think, you know, I've gotten so many comments and emails and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to think of a way where we can put them all in one place or maybe I can answer them publicly. I might put out pages corresponding to each of these uh, podcasts on my website that have maybe responses from me about things. But keep asking them. Keep emailing them. I'll try to get the, those that I can, those that I think that are uh, instructive. Now, back to business. So as I said, two things we have left to do. Both going to be good, right? So the first one is illustrating the four different groups and how they have a different socio-political view of the concept of freedom, of the concept of liberty. And this is a subheading in each of the chapters that Fisher gives. How does this group think of as liberty? And then after that, we can talk about reinterpreting American history in terms of these four f groups and their different interests and their different priorities. Now, the first group, again, the Puritans, right? So they had a concept of liberty pretty different from the modern one. And that is, typically they perceived as liberty as being a kind of ordered aspect of society. That is, Boston could have liberty, the liberty of Boston, the liberty of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But humans didn't necessarily have liberty. Liberty was something that might mean this particular community is not interfered with from beyond, but it wasn't necessarily applied to individuals in the way we understand it now. That is, societies were ordered with a particular, uh, well, to Puritan, Puritans, possibly even divine order, and as part of that order, people, of course, had to be restrained. But this was, liberty was not a concept that necessarily occurred for individual people. Now, when it did, when people did were said to have a liberty, have a freedom, it was meant in a way that we would probably use the word exemption or privilege nowadays. That is the idea that this person has been given the special right to fish in a particular fishing hole. That was a liberty for Puritans, and that's how they used it with reference to individual people. 
Also, they had an idea of liberty. Again, this sounds almost backwards to the idea of freedom that we might have nowadays. But they had a concept of freedoms as being something that uh, is a an obligation of the pol- the body politic as a whole. Now, if you think of, for example, uh, Roosevelt's freedom from want, the idea that people should be free free from wanting things. That is, they should have they should have stuff. They should have all the food they need. They they should have all of this stuff. Now, if you're a libertarian, uh, you might get a little offended by that. Well, what does it mean to have a right to someone? That means that someone else has that blah blah blah, blah et cetera, et cetera. You you've all heard this. But the Puritan concept of liberty is sort of the opposite of this. That is, there are some liberties that, in the same way that you might have the right to use a particular fishing hole, you might have a right or Uh, society might have a right to be entitled to particular things that are, um, you know, uh, come from the body politic. This is our, saying something is our liberty is saying it's our kind of obligation. Uh, It's sort of two sides of the same coin to a lot of Puritans. So that's their conception of liberty. Now the planter concept of liberty is a little bit different as well from the modern concept. Their idea, Fisher describes it as a kind of hegemonic freedom, a hegemonic liberty. And the idea behind it is that for them, traditional culture, their English history, English, the English social environment has in its ups and downs created a society in which they have a particular position. Uh, And they, of course, as aristocrats, have a relatively high position. And their view is a liberty is more or less someone's lot in life. So infringing on an aristocrat's liberty means depriving them of those particular social institutions which they have. Now, for them, a king would have a huge amount of liberty. And if you said something like a king shouldn't be, be able to command one of his subjects, that is something that is against their idea of liberty. In the same way, again, these planters who own indentured servants or later on slaves, their view of liberty is such that it is their position to have a a place in that cosmic order and thus removing their indentured servitude or removing slavery is a violation of liberty and that their view of liberty is this kind of long traditioned social order so that is their view again it's a view of liberty that's very different but you can sort of see the logic behind behind it and how it vibes with their general worldview Now, the Quaker concept of liberty, again, is a little different. Their idea is not that liberty is something that individuals have, but it's a general environment that we live in, and it's a good environment to live in. Liberty is a kind of mutually respecting, reciprocal uh, play field for people to live together uh, in peace. That is, the Quakers, again, they're tolerant of other religious sects, they're tolerant of other ethnic groups, they allow them to move into Pennsylvania and are mostly peaceful with them. And the Quakers have the idea, their view of freedom, their view of liberty is an an environment that people can live in, an environment, a generally, a a good kind of peaceful, not utopia, but something, a, a general environment where people respect the bounds of their own I don't want to say property, but their own moral authority, and don't overstep that. They would look at the planter view of liberty or the Puritan view of liberty and see them as a little overstepping in those bounds. Now, this is somewhat similar but different from the borderer concept. The borderers really have the view of freedom that is most familiar to modern people. It's the idea that, I guess, libertarians or other people enunciate nowadays, and There are two levels you can look at it. You can look at the very basic level where the borderer definition of freedom is get off my lawn. I have my own property. You have yours. Keep to yourself. I'll keep to mine. That's the basic level. At the more big-brained level, and this actually goes back to parts of the Scottish Enlightenment, which again are, are sort of tangentially related to the border environment, and that is uh, borderers have an idea of liberty that amounts to natural law. That is, it's not just that societies have liberty or that individuals have liberty, but really everything in the world, even plants can have a, a domain of liberty in that what that means is that each element 
of the world has its own environment to grow in and what's bad is when one person or you know a, a society tries to trespass those boundaries of what is appropriate so that could mean government interference and that's usually what borders are talk or talking about remember they grew up in anarchy they grew up in an environment where they couldn't trust either government that purported to rule them. So they grew up in an environment where you have to have well-defined property, which is defined by familial relationships and honor. And this is my position. This is yours. We can survive. And similar to the Quaker idea, we can survive by mutually re respecting our own freedom, our own property. Um, and that is the key to success. Whereas the opposite of their definition of freedom is something that's more like the Puritan definition, where liberty is a kind of social order. That is for borderers, contrary to that, is that social order is something that gradually arises, but it's something that's going to be voluntary. You don't have to necessarily constrain people. They are constrained. They're, they're free people and are acting in their own interests. And that's how any kind of social institutions are going to happen. So the borderers, again, they're backwoods people. They have this very get off my lawn definition of freedom, but it's also tied into the general thought at the time of freedom as being something that is natural law. Now, of all the four cultures, I would have to say that probably the borderers have the, def the definition of liberty that has survived most strongest, followed probably by the Quaker, the Quaker's view. Now, the Puritan view and the planter view are a little different, but we can still look at them in the context of the political environment. So let's go ahead and get into American politics as it has formed over the years in terms of these four groups and their definitions of freedom. Now, one of the first important notes in American history is, in fact, I guess what you could think of as a borderer revolution, that is the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, the Whiskey Rebellion, if you don't know, it was a rebellion against particular taxes on whiskey to pay for uh, the debt of the new American Republic, effectively, is what it was. And it, although it was a rebellion of, of some import at the time, it was particularly important because it was the impetus for the switch from the decentralized government of the Articles of Confederation to the more centralized government we have in our constitution now. Now, this was more or less a conflict between borderer people of different origins and the three other groups, the Puritans, the Planters, and the, um, I was about to say the Whigs, the Quakers. I don't I'm, I'm already thinking of Whigs. Um, but this is a conflict between the three groups versus the borderers. Now, the general political, uh, the the general, I don't want to say two-party system, but the dichotomy that you have in early American politics is the strong federal government versus the weaker federal government. Now, initially in the Adams presidency, uh, this is a Puritan government. It's a government centered around uh, Massachusetts. Of course, Jeff or Adams is the second president. The third president is Jefferson. Uh, well, I guess we should put them in ethnic terms. So George Washington was a Virginia planter, um, but he was widely popular regardless for, of course, having his role in the Revolutionary War. Uh, John Adams was a Puritan, and he represented the Puritan interests and their values in a lot of ways. Uh, they put a lot of a lot of the acts that they were famous for were things like the Alien and Sedition Acts, these um, rules that were put in place to, I guess, cause a more morally unified country in a lot of ways. You might think of it as sort of being an Orwellian state, but um, they, their goal was a Puritan one, that is unifying the country in one moral footing. And the third president was, of course, Jefferson, who started to symbolize a movement from a, a unity between the planters and the borderers and sometimes the Quakers against the Puritans. Now, the Puritans were very populous and very powerful at the time, uh, while the other groups were probably less so. Now, as time progressed, you do have this dichotomy between the more federalist people who tend to be Puritan and the less federalist people who tend to be closer to borderers or sometimes, you know, the Virginia planters. Again, particularly with, you know, having to do with issues like slavery as this gradually becomes an issue. But before that happens, um, now one of the first, I want to say he was the eighth president. I should probably have Wikipedia pulled up, but, you know, I'm too good for that. But Andrew Jackson comes to the fore eventually. And Andrew Jackson, in a lot of ways, um, 
you can sort of think of him as the Donald Trump of his time. Now, Jackson was the for first borderer president. Before then, they had been from the other groups, but Jackson was very, one of the first borderer presidents. And he's not just, that doesn't just mean different policy. He, of course, was a member of the Democratic Party who was, uh, it's called the Democratic Party because at the time, the Democratic Party stood for radically decentralized, locally governed uh, government, effectively. And Jackson was not just in favor of this kind of stuff. He was also an extreme kind of a cowboy. Uh, he's known for, uh, he was once almost assassinated and then pulled out his cane and started just beating the crap out of his would-be assassin or something like this. You know, he was, he was rough and tumble. He fought in, of course, the Battle of New Orleans, but had many other scrape-ins with Indians and other, uh, he, he lived on the margins of society. He, in many ways, was a figure that was uh, not didn't pretend to be intellectual and because that's not what borderers cared about he ca he was a guy who took risks and he was a guy who uh, people sort of shook up the political establishment at the time now the borderers who as i said weren't necessarily well represented in american politics before this period the borderers take on as they grew larger a more and more prominent role now as time progressed the other three groups started to uh, move away from this kind of politics and uh, formed what would be called the Whig Party. Uh, now, the Whig Party would serve as this opposition to extreme populism, and the Whigs would tend to be more federalistly inclined. They'd be more, uh, they'd want a more activist government, etc. But these three groups, again, the planters, well, you can think of them as, as sort of two extremes, right? So the borderers have this extremely decentralized, individualistic view of what the society should be like, and the Puritans are on the other side. And the, the Puritans have a moralistic view, they have a Total, I don't want to say totalitarian, it has bad connotations, but a, a totalistic view of the, the moral nature of society. And Puritans felt it was need for, there was a need for moral unity and uh, a kind of un uniformity. Ideally, Puritans want everyone to be a Puritan, but you can think of the conflict between borderers and Puritans, which really in American history were rarely, I don't think, ever aligned. The other two groups would side with one or the other depending on what was uh, best. Now, as the era of Jackson waned, an issue that had more and more prominence is, of course, slavery. Now, borderers themselves wouldn't have that strong of an opinion on slavery. There were borderers who owned slaves. There are people of every group that own slaves. But the people who are primarily going to care are the planters. Again, they're based on a kind of aristocracy, which, after indentured servitude ran out, relied mostly on imported slaves, versus Puritans, who, of course, were moralistically against slavery. They, again, are the party of get rid of alcohol, get rid of slaves, both of them are bad, etc. So this is something that arises as you get further into American history. And if you know anything about American history, you're like one of the th constant issues that happened as people moved westward is every time a new state had to come into the union you had to the two pro-slavery and anti-slavery factions had to work out how exactly is this sla is this state going to allow slaves or not allow slaves and whether or not that it's allowed or not allowed could affect how the Senate works and how some kind of regulation on slavery could be passed or not passed. So this was a constant issue during this period. Now the North, the Puritans were in essence changing part of their life in gradual industrialization. And this would have a lot to do with the coming Civil War. Now the Civil War, now of course, the Democratic and Whig parties were duking it out, but both of them sort of lost prominence. And the Democratic Party, of course, is still around even today. But uh, a new party arose, and that, of course, is the Republican Party, which was an abolitionist party. And it is, at the time, it was a hyper-Puritan party. It, they were viewed as... Uh, as distinct from the Whigs, the Whigs generally were sort of anti-slavery sometimes, but the Republicans were overtly so. Now, the we can skip over details, but the election that led to the Civil War was the 1860 election of Lincoln, and it's an interesting election for a lot of reasons. I don't know if you know about this. Now, uh, Fisher doesn't go so much into it, but it's just interesting to talk about, so I will. Um, during this election, first off, the border, or I should say, there's a loose alliance at the time between um, 
everyone else against Puritans. That is, Puritans are big into the uh, Republican Party, which is just newly founded. And the other groups at the time, sort of the way, well, I should say the Quakers are sort of uh, on with the Republican Party. I, I shouldn't uh, leave them out. But the everyone else, the borderers and the planters and some of the Quakers, are divide, their vote is divided between different Democratic candidates at the time. And during the 1860 election, there are actually three candidates who run for the Democratic Party just because no one can decide which one they want. And they're all regional candidates, interestingly enough. Now, what happens in this election is that, as you would expect, run it with basically three, one ideology running three candidates. The other guy, Abraham Lincoln, wins the election. But he wins on very interesting terms. First off, he loses the popular vote. He gets something like 39% of the popular vote. And you might say, oh, wow, well, I guess that he, well, he does win the Electoral College and, of course, become president. Um, but you might say, oh, well, geez, I guess those Democrats should have gotten it together and, you know, unified all their votes. But it actually doesn't matter because um, in the political, in the Electoral College system, even if all of the Democratic votes had gone to the same candidate, Lincoln would have still carried enough electoral votes to win because he won my well he won by a significant enough margin in the northern states in greater new england not just new england but the places that puritans were gradually starting to settle westward uh, he won by good enough margins there to win enough electoral votes but in the south in the planter and borderer territories the republican party walked away from a lot of states winning less than one percent of the vote now, part of that is because a lot of states didn't even bother putting the Republican Party, which was widely reviled, on the ballot. But in the states where it was on the ballot, uh, Lincoln literally would, like Virginia, Tennessee, Lincoln won something like less than 1% of the vote. So he lost the... He lost to three different candidates, lost bigly in the uh, uh, popular vote, but still, even if those candidates had unified, won the electoral vote and won the election and became president. And so you can sort of understand the controversy behind this election in the first place, um, aside from the fact that a totally new and radical party with uh, strong Puritan uh, moral feelings won the presidency. So this election, of course, is the, the election that precipitates the Civil War. Many different states immediately start uh, seceding from the Union, and then after Lincoln takes some military action, all the rest of them secede, and of course the Civil War begins. Now, of course, we have nothing to say about the military conquests of the Civil War, but needless to say, the Puritans, the Republicans, the Unionists, they win. They win hugely. Um, and it's a very interesting, something interesting happens in the political environment because of this. That is, Puritans have a chance. Well, one thing you have to remember is while the southern states are seceded, the most radical edge of the Puritan uh, political class can pass what they want in the American government. Second off, when the South is conquered and reintegrated into the Union, there re many voters are due to their loyalties to the Confederacy are disenfranchised, first off. Um, that is a part of uh, Reconstruction, and they have to gradually swear loyalty to get their uh, citizenship back or something like that. And many of these states in the elections within a decade or so don't, until they formally reunite with the Union, they don't have any say in the political environment. So what happens is the most radical Puritans, the or as they call them at the time, or even in history books, radical Republicans, really win so hugely that they can pass even the most radical stuff and controversial stuff at the time. Now, at a surface level, slavery is ended, uh, former slaves become citizens. That was a big debate at the time, but the radical edge, again, of the Republican Party won, and they made all slaves citizens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but something even more fundamental happens. I'll, I'll quote from Fisher here. He says, Radical Reconstruction was an attempt to impose by force the cultures of New England and the Midlands upon the coastal and highland south. The southern states were compelled to accept Yankee constitutions and Yankee judges, Yankee politics and Yankee 
Yankee politicians, Yankee schools and Yankee school ma'ams, Yankee capitalists, and a Yankee labor system. So that's what happened. It isn't just that, oh, we pass a bunch of laws that we like, but the North imposes itself in a uh, an event called Reconstruction, which really is the North militarily occupying the South for a prolonged period. Um, they occupy the South and really move out the, the planter aristocracy and try and replace the borderer cultural environment with their own Puritan, or as he puts it, Yankee uh, culture and institutions. Now, this lasts only so long. Um, if you know anything about American history, in 1876, there was an election, a, a contested election, where for the first time in a while, a Democrat finally won the presidency, or at least almost won the presidency. He won the popular vote, lost the electoral vote by only one vote. Um, and there was a bunch of hubbub about it, but one of the things that came from the negotiation is that the North would end the occupation of the South, and that is the troops would move out, and what quickly happened is that Southerners, which of course, again, are, are a, a mix of planters and borderers, would kick out all the Yankees and impose their traditional cultural norms in the area. So, And that's what happened. Now, electorally, it's also important to remember that during the Civil War, um, the Puritans, in effect, allied with the black population of the South because um, they they were viewed, of course, as tactical allies. They The Puritans had, of course, uh, freed these people from slavery. And so even until today, there are, there are some parts in American history where um, blacks and Puritans don't vote for the same party. For example, the New Deal Coalition. But even till today, there's a, a unity between the Northeastern vo voting bloc, the Puritan voting bloc, and the black voting bloc. And this is, so this is something that happened. The lower class of the South becomes Puritan. And in the same way as immigration increases in the North, these immigrants become gradually allied with the South. That is, uh, many Germans, for example, start moving to the United States en masse. And these Germans tend to tactically ally with the borderers or with the other cultures in the South. Now, the Civil War, in a lot of ways, marked a decrease in the relative power of the planters with respect to the borderers in the South. And there are a bunch of people who commented on this in a lot of ways. Now, keep in mind the aristocratic culture of the planters gradually wanes in power. I mean, nowadays, the South is not very aristocratic. It's like something you, you hear in movies or you see in, you know, the goofy films, but it's it's not a reality. Um, but just to give you, for example, H.L. Mencken, who is a, a noted I don't want to say aristocrat, but he was uh, uh, an American intellectual who was intellectual. It seems wrong to call him that, but he was a guy. We'll just say he was a guy who was famous for his support of aristocracy. And when we, he went to the South, he was very disappointed that a lot of this planter culture, this old aristocratic culture, had died away after the Civil War when these institutions were replaced. And what happened was that borderers in their uncouth cultural style started to replace planters. Now, this is Minkin talking uh, of the South. Again, he's complaining about the, the planters losing their aristocratic hold in the South. He says, there's not a single picture gallery worth going to or a single orchestra capable of, capable of playing the nine sympathies sympathies, <laughs> symphonies of Beethoven or single opera house or single theater devoted to decent plays. Now, of course, any good borderer would hear a quote like that and just immediately laugh and ask Mencken if he could fire a rifle or, or castrate a pig or something like this. But there is a change in the South from this planter aristocracy to a more borderer-enveloped uh, culture. Now, politics evolves from this point. Again, you have this general divide from the Democratic Party, which is increasingly becoming more of a regional Southern party, and the Republican Party, which is tends to be a northern party. Um, and from election to election, they might win different states out west. Um, but it depends on the particular politician in question. But eventually, the political system as it is, or at least the Republicans and Democrats as they exist during this period, comes to 
uh, a confusing end in a lot of ways. That is, Herbert Hoover is elected as a Puritan candidate. Again, actually, he doesn't win Massachusetts when he's originally elected. He wins a very interesting, well, you can check the map yourself, but a very interesting setup. But in generally, the Republican Party, uh, which, of course, is the party of great moral principles, including the abolition of slavery and the ban of alcohol, which is now in effect at this period. Um, Herbert Hoover is elected in this party. And the Great Depression happens, and he is blamed for it. Not just that, but people are also starting to sour on alcohol prohibition. And so the Republican Party gradually becomes more and more rejected. And this causes for the election of Franklin Roosevelt, who rules the United States for something like 10 or 12 years. He's uh, by far, he's the only president to actually have served through three terms, and I think he was elected for a fourth um, but uh, so he begins a, a total realignment of American politics. And at the time, originally, the alignment is everyone against the Puritans. Um, when uh, he when Roosevelt run uh, uh, runs against Hoover, Roosevelt basically takes the entire country. Hoover wins. Well, he wins the, the Quaker state of Pennsylvania and he wins a couple northeastern states, not even all of them. Um, but it's, it's really a route. And Fra Franklin Roosevelt remains extremely popular throughout the period. Now, uh, Roosevelt himself, there are a lot of candidates in American history um, who you can trace to one particular background. Now, the thing about Roosevelt at the time is that he had a background in the Northeast, which sort of appealed to Puritans in some, I guess, ethnocentric way. Um, and he, I, th I think he had a Dutch surname, right? So he had that ancestry. But Roosevelt had policies that, in a lot of ways, mimicked the populism that was popular among borderers and stuff like that. So he was a generally popular candidate, and this is why he could win so many elections. Now, the Roosevelt regime, of course, does come to an end, and afterwards, the same kind of ethnic politics reemerge in the United States. Uh, you have, during the Truman and Eisenhower elections, you have more or less the Democratic borderer planter South versus the Puritan and Quaker North. Again, the Quakers gradually give way to other cultural groups that build off of them in a lot of ways, but that's the political divide you have. Now, this divide th doesn't change, but the parties that cloak it change during the 1960s, and that is after uh, LBJ uh, puts through a lot of the Civil Rights Acts. Uh, well, the Civil Rights Acts are politically important for a couple reasons. Now, first off, as, as we said before, when the Puritans freed black slaves in the South, that formed an alliance between them that was is really still still remains till today. And the reason this is important is because uh, they the blacks in the South were a countervailing force in the South to the borderer and the planter cultures. Now, what their blacks are a political anomaly in the United States for a lot of reasons. Culturally speaking, blacks have a lot of these borderer and planter aspects of their culture. Now, they're their own cultural strand in the first place, but as we mentioned before, blacks, for example, speak a variety of, in effect, the planter accent. There are many cultural things that they take from the environment around them, but politically speaking, they are aligned against the borderers and the planters, and both parties have understood that. Now, when Southerners regained control of the South after Reconstruction, they passed many laws that sought to limit the power of blacks as a countervailing voting force in the political system. A lot of those were voting regulations where uh, although due to the, uh, what is it, the uh, 15th Amendment, or is it 14th or 5th? 15th. I should, well, I think it's 15th. Due to the 15th Amendment, you can't make any kind of racial restrictions on a lot of core things in government. However, um, Southerners would try to skirt around this to limit the role of blacks in society by, for example, passing voting regulations that requ required literacy. Um, and blacks were less literate than whites, so that shoved the voting in a more white direction. Now, during the Civil Rights Acts, a lot of these regulations are gradually come to be destroyed, and they come to be destroyed, actually, by LBJ's Democratic Party. And remember, the Democratic Party is the party of the South, originally. LBJ himself 
wins very hugely in the 1964 election, partially because he has some appeal to Southerners, since he is actually a Southerner himself. He's from Texas. Um, but he really has a political program that is more friendly to the North. Of course, it, it contained the Civil Rights Act, which is popular among Northeasterners and blacks. So he wins a landslide election in 1964 against Barry Goldwater. Now, Goldwater is an interesting figure in himself as well. He is Jewish, but he is uh, he takes after a lot of the borderer cultural style. He is a kind of Arizona, I don't want to say cowboy, but he has a cultural conception that we would now think of as being very libertarian in the sense that he was opposed to the civil rights acts, not necessarily because he was distasteful of blacks or wanted to reduce their political power, but because he, a lot of the civil rights acts, if you don't know about this, a lot of them had to do with restricting what a private business can do. It used to be in the United States or, well, a lot of countries, uh, if you had a private business, you had a say in who you could, who could come to your business and do business with you, in effect. Uh, the Civil Rights Acts took away the rights of public or private business owners in public to make racial judgments as to who could use their stores. You can't put up a sign that says no blacks. Now, Goldwater on libertarian principles, on borderer principles, you can think of it, was opposed to these kind of things. Now, the election of 1964 is, uh, is an interesting one. LBJ sort of fought dirty and... Uh, he won hugely just because uh, everyone ended up thinking, Goldwater wasn't really that much of a radical, but people ended up thinking he's some kind of lunatic. So LBJ wins hugely. Goldwater wins only his home state of Arizona and a couple southern states that really just wanted to keep the Civil Rights Acts from passing. Now, this election is so important well, actually, on one level, it's not important. It doesn't change any of the ethnic politics of the United States. The borderers still have their values. The Puritans still have their values. They all still have their collective incentives, etc. But the parties do gradually change. Now, they don't change in every single election afterwards, but this is one of the first where the original alignments of the Democratic and Republican Party are reversed. That is, the South gradually starts to become the home of the Republican Party, which originally was a hyper-Puritan party, but now it's the party of Goldwater. Now it's a much more conservative party, or you could think of it as not necessarily changing that much, but the Democratic Party uh, moves, I guess, towards the left. Um, and so it becomes the party of the Puritans, of the ex-Quakers, and of Southern blacks as well. Now, this isn't to say that every single election afterwards has been like this. Um, and, for example, those elections that are exceptions are those where there is some kind of ethnic reason uh, for an exception. For example, Jimmy Carter was uh, a Democrat, but he actually, when he ran his initial election, he won uh, Georgia and a lot of other southern states because he has, he as a southerner, he's one of the few modern American, modern uh, presidents who actually speaks in a southern accent, in a kind of planter-esque accent. He wins the South relatively well, but he's still a Democrat. He's still, you know, on the political left in America, and he's popular everywhere else. So he won his initial election. Due to political events, he gets crushed by Reagan in 1980. Uh, but that's other details. The other southerner who runs, again, who has some kind of borderer credentials, is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, again, another Democrat who has the policies of the Puritans, but has the, well, no, I shouldn't even say that. Bill Clinton was an exception. He, was, he marked a move from the Democratic Party in the, I guess, the end of the Cold War, so to speak, economically more to the right. This is part of the, what is it, the, the what they call them, the New Democrats. I think that's what they called them at the, uh, back in the day. But he was one of those. But regardless, despite the fact that he was a Democrat and supported policies that were characteristic of Democrats. He did win very well in the South. It wasn't actually just because Ross Perot won. Uh, he did very well uh, independently of that. Now, as it comes to ethnic politics, now this book again was written in 1989. Um, so some of the later things that happen, uh, like for example, the Clinton uh, election later on, the election of... So we can take the ethnic analysis a little bit further and think about more contemporary events and more contemporary politics. Now, one thing to remember is that the four groups are going to support different policies. They define what kind of political issues are 
being accounted for in political life, and they're going to take whatever sides they need. It's very rarely that they agree on much of anything. Now, one of the only things that Fisher notes they do agree on is the 1920s immigration regulation. That is, all of the four groups don't want more groups. They don't want any other people, be they from... I mean, at the time, of course, most all immigrants were coming from Europe, but even those immigrants, they don't want. Now, one of the significant changes that happens in American politics in the 1960s is the 1965 Immigration Act, which people are actually now starting to talk about. The Hart sealer Act, as they call it. And this was important because traditionally, American immigration was... Uh, focused on cultural and racial continuity. That is, we have these four groups, we have this these American cultural strands, and if we have immigrants, those immigrants should come from the same kind of setting that these groups already come from. Now, the hart sealer Act changes that. In a lot of ways, it sort of accelerates. Some uh, later immigration law actually places in quotas that take people from totally different countries. So the United States has millions of people moving into it from Latin America, Asia, uh, parts of Africa, which are the people moving in are very distinct from the Africans who were former slaves. Uh, so there are a bunch of different populations which begin to have their own kind of ethnic conflicts, not just among each other, but with, of course, the four original groups. And this is really the context of the past two presidents that we've had. That is, first off, Barack Obama is a son of one of these immigrant groups. A lot of people think, okay, Barack Obama's black, so maybe his parents were ex-slaves or something. That's not the case. Barack Obama's father, of course, is African-African. Uh, I, th I think he was a professor or something. I don't even know the specifics, but he is uh, straight from Kenya. There is no connection that he has with American blacks, um, but he has that, and he also has a white mother. I don't actually know what her ethnic background is. You could probably look it up yourself, but Barack Obama is an interesting candidate because he's really one of the first, as I said, Van Buren doesn't necessarily fit in the, to, to any of the groups. Um, and neither does Kennedy, and neither does Obama. And Obama is one of the first, well, really the first president we would think of as not even being white. Um, so Obama, of course, is a, a very interesting candidate for that reason. He's one of the first from these non-four uh, groups. In fact, he's not. he has partial European heritage, but again, only partial heritage. And during the Obama administration, you actually see, or the Ob original Obama election, you actually do see some ethnic changes. That is specifically, um, non-white immigrant groups tend to order uh, or merge against the Republican Party in a lot of ways. Now, this wasn't always the case. It used to be, for example, that Asians were a consistent Republican voting bloc. This changed during the Obama election. There was a gradual unity of... Um, what we would now just call non-whites versus whites. And when we say whites, we more or less mean the four groups and whatever white immigrants came in fitting into those four groups. Now, Trump, on the other hand, is sort of the incarnation of the four groups, which are becoming, you could think of as being a little bit more unified nowadays. That is, as there is another racial and ethnic uh, amalgam of people that have a political reality in the United States, the interests of the four groups have become a little bit more unified. Now, Trump is interesting for a lot of reasons. Now, I mentioned earlier, uh, recently in the election, you actually would see some people quoting from this book, quoting from Albion's Seed, about how Trump fits into it. Because Trump, of course, is of German extraction. But as I said earlier, a lot of German immigrants coming into the North would tactically ally with borderers. And Trump is one of the most borderer people you can run across, culturally speaking. He is, Trump might be a New York billionaire, but he has the disposition precisely the opposite of what that is. Trump is one of the most borderer people you could possibly run across culturally. And people were already during the election talking about how popular he was in this quote-unquote Scots-Irish voting bloc or the German voting bloc. Even though people aren't cognizant of these ethnic distinctions in the United States, they do vote very significantly differently. And Trump was very popular among them. Even more important than that is the fact that Trump, despite the fact that he is a Jacksonian cowboy, Trump won states during the election that he wasn't supposed to win. He won some of these states that have a dual Quaker and Puritan uh, 
background that is or states uh, that have uh, well for example he won Wisconsin he won uh, Ohio Iowa uh, Michigan and got close to winning Minnesota which is partially Scandinavian the Scandinavians when they came over politically they've aligned with the Puritans in a lot of ways but they're sort of distinct but he almost won Minnesota. He almost won New Hampshire, and he also almost won Maine. He won one electoral vote from Maine. So as the ethnic politics of the United States change, we might actually see a unity of the four ethnic groups, which colloquially we just call whites. We might just see a unity of whites against the ever-increasing amount of non-whites in the United States. But, you know, that's for history to tell. Uh, we can't be sure if this kind of unity will continue. But it's definitely something that the, the Trump administration has sh shown light on. Now, Trump, of course, himself is a, a personality that rubs, uh, feels like sandpaper to a lot of people, I guess you could say. But if you imagine someone with Trump's semi-protectionist semi and anti-immigrant policies, uh, coming to the fore who is much more personally likable or respectable, a lot of people might be more willing to vote for someone like him. So that's something to see. I think that's a definite possibility in the next election. Um, but otherwise, we can also we might project, it's always unwise to project, but we might project an increase in the racial divide between the two parties. And I think everyone sort of knows this. Everyone sort of has been harking on this for years. Or sometimes, you know, you get a lot of uh, people will give you a lot of shame for harking on it. But it's something that happens. You know, it's something that's happening. But anyway, that's just something to think about. But I think we have spent way more time than I expected on this book. But the reason we have is because there is so much in it. Again, I encourage you, if you don't want to buy the book, check your local library. If they have it, just go there. Don't even have to check it out. Just leaf through it because there is so much about American ethnocultural life, so much of the things that we take for granted that this book talks about and are detailed in the original cultural context. And I think it will when you really think about your own family history if you are an American, or even if you're someone in the United Kingdom who, of course, comes from the same kind of cultural strands. If you think about your own family history in this context, I think it's interesting enough as well. So I encourage you, again, check out Albion Seed for British Folkways in America. And I am Luke Smith. If you have any comments about this episode, Put them in the YouTube description, or no, in the comments section. You can't put things in the description. That's my job. Put them in the comments, or email me at luke at lukesmith.xyz. Actually, just go to my website, lukesmith.xyz. Got ways you can donate, got other stuff to look at, and subscribe to the podcast, notrelated.xyz. Just go there. RSS is there. Everything else is there. Just do it. So that's about it. I'm tired. I've had to re-record parts of this. It was actually sort of a pain. So uh, I'll be having another episode, as I said last time, uh, we'll be having an episode on democracy, and that's going to be next. I'm going to be talking about probably a couple of different books. I'm really just going to be ad-libbing a lot of it, but uh, going to be building off not just Schumpeter's Capitalism, uh, Socialism, and Democracy, but a couple other books I have. I won't tell you them because it's no fun if I tell you what the books are before we do an episode. But uh, also, if you have any suggestions for books to do in the future, I have a list of them that I'm going to be doing, or topics in general that might not have a book. But if you have a suggestion, go ahead and give them to me, because if, you know, I might not have thought about it before or something like that. But anyway, that's it. See you guys next time.